I have breast cancer. I have breast cancer. I have breast cancer. And I needed someone to talk to. I needed information. I needed to know I could do this. I found Living Beyond Breast Cancer, an organization that understands what you need and need to know. They helped me and they can help you too. I have breast cancer and I have support. I have information. And I have hope. I have Living Beyond Breast Cancer. Find five ways we can help you at fiveways.lbbc.org. Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Living Beyond Breast Cancer's Breast Cancer 360. Tonight, our title is Keeping Cancer at Bay, What Researchers Are Learning About Recurrence. I am Jean Sachs. I'm the CEO of Living Beyond Breast Cancer, and I'm really excited to both welcome our in-person audience here in Philadelphia, as well as what I understand is over 1,000 people watching online. So I think what we know is that this topic is of great interest. Um, I think it hasn't been covered enough. And you know, in all my years of working on breast cancer, um, you know, the, we used to say there's really nothing you can do. Just um, after your treatment, we'll, we'll scan you, we'll do some blood work. But now research is finding things that can be done. And we're going to really dive into that topic. Um, so before we get started, I want to thank Merck and Susan G. Komen to help support this program. And I want to thank Jamie LaScala from Wilmington, Delaware, as well as Sue Siever from uh, Salt Lake City, Utah. They are two of our young advocates who have been trained to be leadership volunteers, and they're hosting watch parties in their hometown. Um, so anyone else who wants to host a watch party, just let us know, and um, we'll, we'll make that happen for our next 360. We are going to do have this program in three segments, um, 20 minutes each, and to try to cover a lot of content. In the first segment, we're going to talk about what is a breast cancer metastasis and why is it that these aggressive, both systemic and localized treatment don't seem to get rid of every single cancer cell. In the second segment, we're really going to talk about the clinical trials that are underway to look at this topic. And we're going to hear from Sue and Joan. Sue is actually participating in a clinical trial. And Joan is a patient advocate for clinical trials, which is a really unique and important role, which you know her role is to make sure that the patient experience, your experience, is taken into account when they create the design of the trial. And then in the final segment, we're going to talk about lifestyle things. What can you do without going to the doctor to reduce your risk of recurrence? So we've got a lot to cover. I really want to welcome Dr. D. Michelle and Sue and Joan, and thank you for being with us this evening. I also want to let you know that my colleague Janine is ready to take your text questions. So um, as soon as you have questions, text them to her. She is really good at sorting them and figuring out uh, when we need to take a break and ask questions. So just start sending them whenever you're ready. So we're going to start with Dr. D. Michelle, who is a co-leader of the Breast Cancer Research, Pro Research Program at the Abramson Cancer Center. She's also a practicing medical oncologist at the University of Pennsylvania. So let's just start by saying, what is a breast cancer metastasis? Well, you know, um the good news is that we do find most breast cancers very early, and they're localized just to the breast. And treatments are very effective to um, eliminate the cancer in most women who are diagnosed. However, we know that for a substantial proportion of women, um, the cancer can ultimately come back someplace outside of the breast. So when we talk about metastasis, we're really talking about cells that have escaped from the primary tumor in the breast and have managed to find their way to other places. Breast cancers can metastasize to the bones, to organs like the liver or the lungs, um, and even to lymph nodes or to the other breast. We really feel that we need to figure out how these cancer cells get to those places because it's when they reach the organs and other places where they can cause trouble. That's right. And so what are researchers studying um, to learn you know, how they spread and um, you know, what, what they can do to sort of stop it from coming back? Well, I think there's a couple of really important avenues of investigation going on right now. The first is really studying the metastases themselves. So increasingly, we're actually obtaining biopsies 
of the metastatic lesions from the places where they have gone, from you know, a liver biopsy, a lung biopsy. And looking at that, uh, that metastasis, those cancer cells under the microscope, really doing a deep dive into the genes that are turned on, the pathways that are activated, and actually going back and comparing those cancers to the patient's original cancer in the breast. And by looking at how those two are different, we can understand what the cancer needed to do to adapt and evade the original treatment and manage to get to another spot. So there are many studies going on around the world, really, um, to try to understand the biology of metastatic disease. And that's also going to help us find new treatments, because if we really understand what's allowed those cancer cells to metastasize, it also can tell us what's enabled them to stay alive in their location and be able to find even better treatments for metastatic disease. So we think that's going to be really a game changer in terms of being able to treat metastatic disease better. But I think the slide actually would be a good time to look at that. This tells you the other way we're thinking about um, this problem and how to tackle it. And so what you can see there is on the left-hand side, the primary tumor. And that's a cluster of cells. And we know that there is what's called heterogeneity in those cells, meaning not every cell is the same. And buried within that tumor are these little seeds, cells that are different than the rest of the cells in the tumor, cells that have this capacity to leave the tumor. And we think that they go into the bloodstream. They circulate. Those are called circulating tumor cells, or CTCs. You've probably heard about those. We also think they then actually find a sanctuary, a safe place, where they then can actually go dormant. So it's sort of like thinking about this cell that's been dividing, now is reaching, um, most commonly, the bone marrow. And when it reaches the bone marrow, it powers down. It stops dividing. It goes to sleep. And it can actually stay there in this sleeping state um, for a long period of time. And this is why, for some women, recurrences happen 5, 10, even 20 years later, because those cells have been there. They just haven't been causing any trouble. And we also know that, for some women, those cells never cause a problem, that they may always be there. And for whatever reason, they don't wake up, or the immune system can take care of them. But unfortunately, that isn't the case for everyone. And something, things that we're just now starting to understand, triggers will reawaken the cells, reactivate them, turn them back on, power them back up, and that's when they then leave the marrow, go back into the bloodstream, and find their way to another place. So we really need to understand what allows the cells to leave the tumor, what mechanisms they use to actually find their way to the marrow, how they stay asleep, what wakes them up, and how they home their way to other places. So I'm sure for anyone living with a history of breast cancer, it's, it's kind of scary to think that these cells are there. Do we think they've always been there? Do we think they're, they get there later and they go to sleep and then what we don't know is what wakes them up? Or? I mean, I think that um, you know, when I talk to women who have breast cancer, even a stage one or stage two breast cancer, we always talk about this risk, this risk of the cancer coming back. Um, and so I know that every woman who's been diagnosed with breast cancer lives with worry about, well, is it going to come back? And up to this point, unfortunately, all we've been able to do is watch and wait. So I think actually having a better understanding and knowledge about what might be happening and then developing the tools that will enable us to actually find the cells is really empowering. Mm -hmm. And so. To have a tool that could enable us, or a test that could enable us to find the cell, means that we could screen patients, and that you could come in and have a test. And if you don't have the cells, well, what a huge relief, right? Finally, we could say, you're OK. Right. But if you do have the cells, we now are developing things that we can do to actually attack those cells. So I think the fact that, you know, we always say knowledge is power, mm -hmm. but I think that this is, it's really the case here that it's empowering to really understand. It's not just a black box. It's not just a risk or a fear. There's actually some science here that we can point to and things that you can do um, to be proactive. 
So if someone does find out that they have dormant tumor cells, does that mean they have metastatic breast cancer? What does that mean? So this is a really, really important point because I can only imagine that this is a little scary to even hear about or think about, but it's, it's incredibly important to understand that just because these cells might be there doesn't mean that you have metastatic breast cancer, that these cells may never hurt you. They may sit there doing nothing. They may ultimately be um, controlled by your immune system or other things that your body can do to eliminate them, or maybe they just can't last. But even when we do a test, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes, mm -hmm. to look for the cells, and even if we find the cells, we don't yet know in which patients those cells would ultimately have caused a problem. And so it's still very early days with this research. And these tests are still very preliminary. They are investigational. We don't want to um, have people come and have a test when we don't know necessarily what it means or what to do about it. So it's really important to understand the things this test can do and the things these tests can't do. Okay, I think Janine has a question. We do have one question, which is, are there certain kinds of breast cancer that are more likely to send the cells to a distant site than others? That's an excellent question. So the mechanisms that we'll talk about that these cells use to survive really do cut across all the different subtypes of breast cancer. So we think that the approaches that we're using will be applicable regardless of the kind of breast cancer that someone started out with. However, we know that the likelihood of recurrence does differ across different subtypes. And partly that's because we have therapies that can get into the bloodstream and then get to the marrow and get to these cells with certain types of breast cancer. So for example, if you have estrogen receptor positive breast cancer, it's becoming increasingly clear that taking anti-estrogen treatments may be helping these cells stay asleep, which might explain why our data is showing that the longer and longer you stay on these treatments, the better the outcomes are, the less likely it is for the cancer to come back. So there are treatments that can modify the likelihood of the cancer cells coming back depending on the subtype. But we do think that all cancers use some very similar mechanisms. Okay. Do you have another question? Or? Well, um, several people are asking what are the tools used to find the disseminated tumor cells and circulating tumor cells? Okay, great. So what are these tools? So when we talk about disseminated tumor cells, or DTCs, those are the cells that we find in the marrow. And the bone marrow seems to be a very welcoming place for these cells for whatever reason. So we can do a test where we take a sample of the liquid part of the bone marrow. It does require a bone marrow biopsy. And we can then take that to the laboratory and we can perform a test that helps us pull out all of those blood cells that are also there and actually identify cells. And we can see them under the microscope that look like tumor cells. So that's one tool is to use a test for DTCs. Another type of test is actually using the ability to find these cells in the bloodstream. That's a test for circulating tumor cells or CTCs. And you've probably heard about some of these tests because they are on the market. So there's a test by Cell Search, for example, that's for CTCs. The third way that we might be able to find these cells is not by looking for the cells themselves, but for their DNA. And that means looking for fragments of DNA that are in the bloodstream that we know came from the tumor. And that is um, a test that's called cell-free DNA. And there are also several companies on the market that can um, identify cell-free DNA in the blood. But I do caution to say that many of these tests, while they are um, useful and they do identify some patients who have the cells, it's still not clear who should have the tests and what we should do if we find the cells. And so that's why the research is so important. And I think, actually, it's very important to have the testing done in a research setting, rather than simply going to your doctor and saying, I want you to send this test mm -hmm. off, because your doctor might not yet know what to do with those results. We haven't yet figured out what's the right strategy for taking care of those cells. So seeking out a trial or a study 
where researchers are really learning from this testing and can help you make sense of what this testing means is very, very important. So you're not recommending that people go and get these tests without being in a trial? I feel strongly that okay. that is um, you know, not the best way to go because, again, I think, yes, knowledge is power, but getting um, information from a test when you don't when you or your doctor don't necessarily know how to interpret it or how to react to it can actually increase your anxiety, right? Or to make you feel like, well, now I know something that I wish I, I didn't know. So we want to be able to utilize these tools in a really safe and thoughtful environment where we're going to partner together to understand what it all means. OK, Janine. So we have a couple more questions about the difference between um, the difference between a, a disseminating tumor cell and a metastasis. So one question is, um, if your pathology shows that you have DCIS, is that the same as having a dormant cell? And so I just want to be that? really clear that we we don't think that we find these dormant cells in the breast itself. So DCIS is a condition of cells that are abnormal just inside the ducts of the breast. So that's not a dormant cell. Even if you have a biopsy that shows invasive breast cancer in the breast, that's not a dormant cell. Dormant cells are asleep. They're not dividing. They're just sitting there being very quiet. Cancer cells, on the other hand, that are active or metastasizing, they're dividing, they're growing, they're multiplying. That's a very different situation. So when we're doing mammograms, we're looking for actively dividing cancer cells. When we do biopsies, we're testing tumors. These are not dormant cells. It's really these sleeping cells that we're looking for now in the blood and the bone marrow. Very different. Okay. Janine, did you have a second? Yes. Does insurance cover the cost of DTC tests or CTC tests? So it's a controversial issue, um, but I would say that for the most part, some insurance companies do, some don't. And part of the reason is that um, I think that increasingly um, the coverage is based on really having evidence that we know how much having these cells might be harmful. The data that we have so far about disseminated tumor cells in the bone marrow suggests that women who have these cells have anywhere from a two-fold higher risk of a recurrence to a nine-fold higher risk of recurrence. But having the cells in the marrow is not a 100% chance of getting a recurrence. And similarly, even if you have a negative test, it doesn't mean that the cancer can't still come back. Maybe the test was a false negative. So until the tests are better, most insurance companies are not necessarily going to cover them, but some do for the commercial tests that are out there. It's also the case that some tests, uh, for example, the cell-free DNA tests, um, are useful in other kinds of cancer. So they get approved for that reason, and then patients might start to use them for breast cancer. We'd really like to know how useful they are here before we start ordering them. But under the clinical trial, everything would be covered, right? So the good thing about being a participant in a clinical trial is that the things that we do that are research-based, like the testing for the cells, is covered. You don't have to worry about whether or not your insurance would cover this kind of a test. In addition to doing these standard tests and, and giving you the information about them, we also do a lot of research testing. We want to come up with better tests, right? more sensitive tests, tests that allow us to not just see the cells, but actually look at how they work. So when you're participating in a clinical trial, you're getting the test, you're getting it covered, so you're getting it for free, you're getting results in, in many of our clinical trials, but you're also contributing samples to help us do a better job of developing better tests. Right. All right, I know you have one more question, Janine. Yes. So we, we have uh, a couple of folks who are asking, how is it possible that these cells can escape the toxicities of chemotherapy or really any treatment that goes throughout the body? You know, that's the really the $64,000 question right there. There's man, many, many I think it's like the multi researchers dollar right question. <laughs> who are trying to understand this. There are a couple of things that we do know. 
So we know about a few processes and pathways that seem to be important. One of these is something called autophagy. So one of the ways that we get cancer cells to die is by cutting off their food supply, um, by you know, using drugs that, that cause them to not be able to get the energy that they need. But cells that have become dormant, cells that have entered this phase, um, have learned how to survive without needing any external energy sources. That's called autophagy. Actually, the Nobel Prize in medicine was given to the person who discovered that this very year. Um, but this is increasingly being recognized in the field of oncology as a way that cancer cells can um, support themselves, uh, even when the, they're getting this onslaught of chemotherapy. And we have drugs now that can actually interrupt that, to, can prevent the cancer cells from being able to use this mechanism to support themselves. We also know that there's a pathway called mTOR, and I think about the mTOR pathway as kind of like the electrical circuit of the cell, that this is a, a way in which the cancer cell can send messages um, around. And this also enables the cancer cell to, um, to go into the dormant state. And this uh, circuitry is really important to maintaining the viability of the cell. And this is something else that we, again, have drugs that can actually interrupt this and basically turn off the electrical circuitry. The third process is um, something called CMET. And CMET is another important pathway that we think about in these cells as sort of restarting the engine. So after the cells have been asleep for a long time, for reasons that we don't yet understand, they can start to activate this pathway. And that sort of turns the engine of the cell back on and the cell starts to divide and grow again. And we've learned about these really from the laboratory work that's been done by many researchers, including my, my colleague, Louis Chodash, who have studied this process in mice. And so unfortunately, we, we have to give the mice cancers to learn this. But when we do that, when we implant the tumors in the mice, we can actually label the tumors with a little um, marker that glows. And then we do everything in terms of treating the mice that we would do in the clinic. And the cancer cells all start to melt and, and go away. But these little seeds are left behind. And we can actually see what happens to those cells in the mice. And by learning these lessons from the mice, we then can apply these um, technologies to be able to try to find the cancer cells in patients. Great, and thanks for explaining sort of what what's happening in the lab and how that helps us figure out what to do on people. I think it's important. So I think Janine and I can move to the next section. Great. I knew our audience. I knew our audience was going to have a lot of questions, yeah. <laughs> so we'll we'll try to balance that. So we've talked a lot about you know what makes a, a cancer cell metastasize and why do some cancer cells go to sleep and why do they wake up. Um, but now we really want to turn the discussion to someone who's had early stage breast cancer and is considering doing these trials. And we are fortunate to have someone here with us today who has done this. So I really want to turn to Sue and Joan for a few minutes. Um, so Sue, let's just start with you and if you can just tell us a little bit about why you're with us tonight. Okay. Um, I, was, I was diagnosed with breast cancer and it was early stage breast cancer in October of 2014. I had a regular uh, mammogram, and um, it was my regularly scheduled mammogram, and this very tiny little cancer tumor showed up on the, ma on the mammogram, and it ended up that it was stage one. Uh, my surgeon at the time said, you are a, a, a poster child for mammograms because um, this didn't show up with any other you know, manipulation or anything like that. So um, <clears throat> it was stage one. My uh, lymph nodes were clear, but I had an oncotype test. And the oncotype test came back at a score of 48. And that's a high score, which means that it's a very active tumor. So when I saw Dr. De Michelle, then um, she said, well, you will be doing chemotherapy. You will be doing radiation. And then, um, because it's estrogen positive, you'll be on an aromatase inhibitor. So I did all of those things. And I've, you know, that's been two years you know, along the road. And then in um, January 
of this year, I saw Dr. De uh, Michelle on one of my regular appointments. And um, she mentioned, and she explained to me exactly what she just explained to all of you, that there's these dormant cells, and if you've got an active you know, tumor, that sometimes those dormant cells can migrate to other parts of the body and then could eventually wake up and lead to metastatic breast cancer. And she said, I have a, um, I have, first of all, a study, which was called Surmount, uh, to determine if you do, in fact, have these, these dormant cells. And then if you do, then I have a trial for you, and we will try some of these medications to try and destroy those dormant cells. So I did the study, Surmount, and I did have the dormant cells. And um, then I did the, the, uh, the, the trial. And so I'm here because I did do a trial for this. And uh, I'm glad I did. So tell us what it was like to have the bone marrow biopsy. That's that like? something that there's always a lot of anxiety over. Mm -hmm. um, and I was very intimidated when I went in the first time. And uh, the nurse explained to me what was going to happen. Um, very sterile atmosphere. Um, basically what she did is she numbed me up a lot. Mm -hmm. um, and that was the surface type of thing, explaining to me that she was going to insert a needle that was going to go into my bone marrow. And she said, yes, there will be discomfort, but it will be five seconds. And, um, and so, I mean, she was great. She, she did a wonderful job. She, I was numb, I did not feel the needle. The only thing I felt was the aspiration of the bone marrow. And it's uncomfortable, but um, frankly, if you're, a, if you're a breast cancer survivor, you've been through a lot of things. Um, it, to me, it was five seconds of discomfort, and it didn't, didn't bother me okay. and much. Then, and Dr. D. Michelle, is that typical, or what? I mean, the, it sounds scary. I know it sounds very scary. These, this is a procedure that we've been actually using for decades um, for patients who have leukemia and other kind of blood cancers. Um, I wish that there was a test that was so good that we didn't have to look in the bone marrow. We could actually look in the blood, but we, the tests aren't good enough to find it in the blood yet. So the marrow is where we need to go. And we've been studying what the patient's experience is, getting the bone marrow and ways in which we can try to make that more comfortable. I would say that Sue's experience is fairly typical, um, that um, there's a lot of trepidation, but that once patients do it, they realize it re wasn't as bad as they thought it would be. I've heard patients tell me it's sort of like having dental work. It's really <laughs> unpleasant at the time, yeah. but the next day, like, you're okay. It's, you know, it varies. Some patients feel more pain than others. Some people will have some bruising, um, but they're, they're really, it's not a dangerous procedure. We do it right in the office. I think this might be a good time to yeah, look at the was, slide. It is. Um, because it, it really sort of lays out for you what, what Sue and I were just talking about, which is that, you know, you come into the clinic, you have the screening with the bone marrow and the blood sample, and then you get those results. And if they're positive, then you're offered the opportunity for treatment on the trial. And then you do have to have several other bone marrow tests so that we can see if the cells are going away or not, because that's actually how we measure whether or not the treatments are working. And so over time, as patients enroll in the trial, we'll get an experience with each of the drugs that we're using to be able to find those that do the best job of eliminating the cells. And at the same time, as I said before, we're sending this to the laboratory not just to measure cells, but actually develop better ways of finding them. So I know we, we talked a little earlier about the pathways, which is great, but could you talk about some of the medicines that are being studied? Yes, so we talked about three main pathways. The first two are the ones that the trials are targeting now. Autophagy was the, path, was the process that the cells use to use their own energy sources. The drug that we're using is called hydroxychloroquine. Interestingly, this is a drug that was actually used um, for malaria uh, for many, many years. Uh, it's been used for rheumatoid arthritis uh, as an anti-inflammatory. But it turns out in the laboratory, it's a particularly good way to block autophagy. It's a pill. It's 
easy to obtain, it's very inexpensive. So it's actually a great example of a way that we could use an old drug to do new tricks, right? To, to find a new use for this drug that um, we already knew about and it's been used in millions of people and we know that it's safe. Um, the other drug that we're using right now is a drug called uh, Everolimus or Affinitor and it blocks that pathway called mTOR, the one that I said was like the electrical system of the cell. Um, it's also an oral drug and um, it's also FDA approved and used for all kinds of different kinds of cancer, but never been used in this particular, uh, for this particular indication before. So those are the two drugs that are in the trial right now. The trial that's happening right now is happening just at Penn, but there will be another trial coming in the springtime that will be opening across the country as part of the Translational Breast Cancer Research Consortium, the TBCRC, that will also use hydroxychloroquine and a different drug to block mTOR called jadatolosib. So, you know, we're, we're testing different drugs, but those are the main ones right now. Okay, and I think you, you really did talk a little bit about this, but maybe you can make it even clearer. Like, who can take part in these trials? What are, what are, the, what are the main factors? Well, so, you know, I think that it's very important that we start with the testing in the patients who we already know are at high risk. And so our trials are primarily focused on women who had positive lymph nodes or had triple negative breast cancer or who took neoadjuvant preoperative chemotherapy and still had cancer at the time of surgery. That's called residual disease. Um, so those are the main criteria, and then of course situations like Sue's where the oncotype was very high. So these are um, factors that you already know and have talked to your doctor about do predict risk of the cancer coming back. So right now those are the patients, and in general we do need to limit this to the first few years after the diagnosis. We know that you know most of the risk will go away if you make it to two years and then to five years. So we are really looking within that first two to five year uh, time period. And is that of finishing your primary treatment That's but right. not counting hormonal therapy then? Correct. So it's really important that we don't do anything to interrupt the standard therapy like Herceptin or chemotherapy or radiation. We want to make sure everyone's gotten those and that nothing that you do as part of the trial would in any way diminish that or make it hard to complete that. Okay. Can you help the audience understand how is this different than what women are doing who are taking hormonal therapy, which is really also prevention, right? And yes. How is this different? So you've all heard the term adjuvant therapy, and those are drugs that, or any kind of treatment that we give after the cancer's already been removed. So adjuvant chemotherapies we give you know, you'll take four cycles or eight cycles of chemotherapy. Adjuvant radiation is radiating the breast or radiating the chest after the cancer has been removed. The difference between those treatments and this one is that we are giving those treatments to everyone based on risk. We don't have a test to help us decide who we should be giving the treatment to and who not to give it to. We just give it to everyone at risk for a certain amount of time. These treatments have really improved survival from breast cancer tremendously, and they're very, very important. I think what we now feel like we need to do to close the gap for those remaining women who, even despite doing all of this, still have the cancer come back, is really find the women who have the cells, rather than continuing to treat everyone, even the patients who don't need it. We want to really focus our attention now on the women who do need it. Janine, do you have a question? Are there any age restrictions on eligibility for the trial? No, there are no age restrictions. So, and one other question that's come up from a couple different people is, how accurate are the disseminating tumor cell tests? Are, is it possible to have these, um, these cells in other areas besides the bone marrow? So those are two excellent questions. So part of our research is to try to understand how accurate the test is. There, the studies where I quoted you the risk, um, that the risk increase if you have the cells, those are based on studies that were done 10 to 15 years ago um, with the very same tests that we're using now. So this is a test that's been around for a long time. However, like many tests, it, it's not using the latest technology, and so it's going to miss some patients who have the cells, 
Uh, and, um, and so there's also a threshold. You have to have a certain number of cells for us to be able to find them. So the test isn't perfect. We know that. When we do find them, we feel fairly confident that we are finding something real, but it's possible that we could miss them. And this is why we're all, not just Penn, but many other places working on finding better tests. Okay, great. Um, so I want to I want to bring Joan into this discussion you've been waiting so patiently. Um, but Joan, I know you're a patient advocate for clinical trials. So so tell us what why you're here and what you want to share with us. Um, I became involved as a member on Dr. Demichel's uh, team in 2015 as a patient advocate um, to kind of bring the patient's perspective uh, to the table. I can give you a little brief um, background of my own uh, breast cancer history. I was diagnosed in 2003 with stage two breast cancer. I had seven positive lymph nodes and I had uh, chemotherapy, uh, radiation, mastectomy, and then I kind of went along my, my merry way until um, very early in January of 2007, I was diagnosed with uh, metastatic uh, breast cancer. And I've been doing well, you know, since then. Um, I feel I have nothing to complain about, even though I feel like I'm always complaining. <laughs> but in, in any case, I um, became involved with the team um, to bring the patient's perspective to the table. In, in this particular trial, um, we were very concerned about the, uh, the number of um, bone marrow aspirations and how the how patient could experience them and have um, discomfort. I think part of the bigger picture is that we help clinicians and scientists maybe understand what the barriers might be to, for patients to come into a clinical trial. So in this case, it was a procedure that we felt could be a problem. Other times, it could be a lot of, uh, let's say, a lot of blood draws, scans, um, it can uh, affect patients uh, depending on, say, how close they live to the hospital where the research center is. So it could be a geographical problem. If they have to come often, um, they may uh, have to take days off from work if they're working, using their paid time off. So these are all um, different kinds of barriers, as well as financial barriers, such as, may, as, such as maybe having to pay a babysitter if they have to come into the to clinic a lot. So we try to keep the um, clinicians like informed about what we feel might be barriers to patients enrolling because it's very important to conduct clinical trials to, to move forward in being able to stop recurrence, let's say in this case, and, and also for other reasons with other clinical trials in breast cancer. And I think, I think that's great that you do it. I think that it's great that their team has welcomed you. I mean, I think this is some of the changes that breast cancer advocacy have created, that we have patients, consumers sitting at the same table with um, doctors and researchers. And really, I mean, bar barriers are a problem. So if you can't get people to participate. I want to follow up on just yeah. one thing that Joan said, because she said, you know, one of their major concerns was, um, would the bone marrow be a barrier? And so we talked a lot about this with our advocate team. And they said, you know, it, maybe a video would be a good idea because then patients could see what is a bone marrow aspirate really all about. They helped us to make a video. One of our advocates volunteered to have the bone marrow. We filmed it. It's on our website. So this way, when patients are contemplating this, they can actually see what would be involved. And that's something that I wouldn't necessarily have thought to do as a researcher, but the patient advocates really came up with a great idea, and that's exactly the kind of thing that we need to help us understand what will help patients. That's great. I know Janine has a question. So <laughs> one of the issues that's come up for a couple people is the side effects of the study drug, and this actually isn't something we talked about in preparing for the program um, in terms of the patient advocate, but um, some of these folks with early stage disease are asking, what are the side effects of, of the drugs in the trial, and how do you weigh participating in the trial when you don't have active metastatic disease, but you would be taking, taking a drug that would have side effects? Well, I could start question. by just saying how we choose drugs and what, how we weigh that when we think about the research, and then I think maybe Sue should talk about her experience. Okay. But I mean, we, 
recognize that um, many women who are participating in this trial might be cured even without doing this. So it's incredibly, incredibly important that the drugs that we choose are safe, that they have a track record, that we know what the side effects are. This is why we've chosen drugs that are FDA approved or that are, uh, have a lot of experience with them. And as part of a clinical trial, we monitor the toxicity. So we are seeing the patients every two to four weeks we have you know, a way for them to contact us. We are paying a lot of attention to the side effects because this can't work if the drugs are too toxic. Um, it's, it, you know, it, it, and, and when we want to learn about whether a, 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 an approach can work, it has to be tolerable. So for this to be an effective strategy, not only does it have to be effective against these cells, but it has to be something that people can tolerate and go about their lives and not have long-lasting side effects. Um, there are side effects to the drugs because you're taking a very large amount of a drug that might normally be used for something else, but it's going to be used to try and kill cancer cells. Um, and when I, you know, from the very outset, Dr. De Michelle said, if you are having difficulty, and there's, there's also nurses um, that are in charge of the study, um, they give you their telephone number. Um, Dr. De Michelle gives you her telephone number. Um, and if you're having difficulties, then they expect you to call. And um, that was really true throughout my entire cancer treatment. Um, if I was having difficulties, I was expected to call. They wanted to alleviate all the side effects, even when you're going through chemotherapy. Um, so um, I did have some side effects. Um, and I made those telephone calls, and the nurses brainstormed with Dr. De Michelle, and they came back with some solutions, and they gave me some other things that I could take to alleviate the side, the side effects. And um, at one point, we decided to back off some of the dosage. So that, you know, it was not, was not horrible. You know, it was worthwhile. I would okay. definitely do it. That's great. I, yeah. I, know. I think it's important also just to say this is how all <clears throat> clinical trials work. So, I mean, I, yeah. I'm glad you had a good experience with us, but I think this is, this is how we do clinical trials wherever you would go is really this kind of a partnership and communication. Right, and very, very uh, patient-centered. You're really focusing mm -hmm. on the patient. Yeah. Okay, Janine, go ahead. Before you can enroll in the clinical trial, do you have to be screened for metastatic disease? So for this particular trial, and for most trials like this, um, yes, we do work closely with the patient's doctor to say, you know, you need to go and have a checkup. You need to make sure that you're not having any symptoms that make your doctor suspicious about cancer. And if you are having any symptoms or concerns, that they do any testing. We don't do any specific testing ourselves as part of the trial. We rely on the patient's physician to do that before they come to us. Okay. I know we need to move to the next segment, but I, we haven't really talked at all about sort of the emotional impact of doing a trial like this. So I don't know if you wanted to say, or either one of you, a few words about what it might like, what it might like be for a woman who is considering doing this um, and you know being tested and maybe finding out something that. Right. Um, I should say, you know, even from the very beginning, um, I was not overly surprised when I was diagnosed or shocked, I should say, when I was diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, and I always kind of try and believe that it's going to work out. And when I went through the process of the lumpectomy and then the, the chemotherapy and all of that, I always believed that I was going to be cured mm -hmm. at each step. So when I did the surmount, I thought, oh, I'm, it, yeah, I'm not going to have those DTCs. It's not <laughs> going to be a problem. And I got the call, and they the nurse said, yes, you do have the DTCs, and it only showed up on one of five slides, but if it shows up once, that means you have it. And so it's a positive. And um, I said, okay, and that was a little bit hard to digest because I thought, and I think when you go through your cancer treatment, you think you're done, and you're not. So that was kind of an eye-opening thing. 
Um, Dr. De Michelle actually called me that night after I spoke with the nurse, and we spoke, we talked for a good half hour where she really talked me through it and just you know explained to me what was go what what the trial would be about and 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 all of that, and so I entered the trial and um, I entered the trial with the expectation that this is just one more step in my treatment. Okay. This is the next step in my treatment. This is what I have to do in order to make sure that my breast cancer doesn't come back somewhere else in my body. Right. And so I, I felt very, I felt proactive. I felt like I was in control. Um, I'm gonna, I don't wanna cut yeah. you off, but I know, I, I don't wanna yeah. short shrift lifestyle changes, because I think they're right. important. But I also want to say thank you because not only are you hopefully helping yourself, but you're helping so many others and all, both of you for working on clinical trials and how important that is. We're going to explore emotional issues more in depth at a webinar that we're doing on December 12th. So we understand the emotional impact and fear of recurrence are big. So go on to our website and please sign up for that webinar. But I do want to just spend the time we have left really talking about lifestyle changes because I know there's always a lot of questions about what food should I be eating and how much should I be exercising and should I be avoiding alcohol. Um, so first, are there any trials or research being done to really look at lifestyle in terms of preventing a metastasis? So the, it, the good news is yes, there are clinical trials of lifestyle interventions and these typically take the form of exercise trials or diet trials. Um, occasionally, some of the trials will use common over-the-counter types of things like aspirin. So there's a trial going on to look at whether aspirin can help reduce uh, recurrence. The, the big trial going on right now for exercise and physical activity is called Be Well, B-W-E-L. You can find that online. That's going on around the country, and that's looking at whether doing a set amount of exercise uh, in a particular way will reduce the risk of recurrence. So I think that what's particularly challenging about this area is that it's always hard to tease apart what the um, impact of different things would be. So we want to study diet. But we can't have people just eat one food. You know, we can't have one group of patients eat <laughs> spinach and another group of patients eat asparagus and nothing else and actually be able to do a clinical trial, right? Um, so we're trying to learn about these things in the context of your whole being, and that's challenging. Even looking at something like alcohol. Well, people who drink alcohol might have different diets than people who don't drink alcohol. They might have different levels of physical activity than people who don't drink alcohol. So how do you tease apart whether it's the alcohol that's the problem or the other things? And that's really a challenging problem. And I, you know, I have training in epidemiology. I think that's sort of where I put my epidemiology hat on is to say, we just have to figure out how to do these trials. They're hard, but we need to do it. And we need to, we, I think there's an increasing recognition in the field that this has been underappreciated, and we now need to turn our attention to this rather than thinking about using a medicine or a pill to solve every problem. And so these trials have the support of the National Cancer Institute. There are trials also going on in Europe with the same issues, uh, really trying to figure out how to do these trials right and tease apart these, these particular aspects. Did you mention vitamin D? Are there trials on vitamin yeah, D? Yeah, so also? vitamin D is a really controversial and tricky sort of thing. It seems to be important in many of the things that are necessary for our cells to function properly. And there are clinical there are studies in breast cancer on both sides that vitamin D deficiency is a problem or de vitamin D, D deficiency isn't a problem. Um, there is an ongoing trial, I think it's completed now, but it was, and we don't have the results yet, looking at whether supplementing or repleting vitamin D would decrease recurrence. And so we anxiously await the results of that trial. In the interim, my feeling is, as long as you take an amount that isn't harmful, it can't hurt. And that's, I think, a way to look at many of these things. We don't yet know whether or not exercise will definitely reduce recurrence, but it can't hurt, and it has so many other benefits, so why not do it? And so that's really how we, we advise the patients these days. 
Okay. But if you can participate in, in a trial, all the better, because then we will learn the answers. Right. And I know um, just a few days ago, the American Society of Clinical Oncology released a pretty strong statement about um, a negative correlation between alcohol and breast cancer. Um, so I just thought maybe you would, is it okay yes, to have to drink it all a little bit? Yeah, this is a, t this is a <laughs> tough one. Um, I think that we've, for a very long time, probably at least 10 to 15 years, <laughs> known that that too much alcohol is definitely related to getting breast cancer or the breast cancer coming back. The question is how much is too much? And I think that for a long time we thought that it was okay to get a, away with maybe four to five alcoholic beverages a week. And, and it's not, not all alcohol is created equal because if it was red wine, well maybe it was also, we know it's also having some favorable effects on cardiac health. And so you really have to balance these two things, but the statement by the American Society of Clinical Oncology last week we actually came out much stronger than that, which, which was really saying there really is no safe amount of alcohol to consume on a regular basis. That doesn't mean that at your daughter's wedding you don't have the champagne or that, you know, once in a while you go out to dinner and have a glass of wine, but this is regular consumption of alcohol, that there really isn't a safe amount. I think that, um, again, where we are in our field is trying not to apply these um, kinds of uh, uh, recommendations to everyone. What we really need to figure out is who's safe to eat, drink alcohol and who's not safe to drink alcohol. The next set of studies that are being done are really trying to understand that so that it's not a one size fits all recommendation. Mm -hmm. But for now, I would say I am changing my recommendations to patients, whereas before I was saying four to five glasses a week was okay, now I'm saying I think it should be less frequent than that. Okay, that's, that's good to know. Janine, do you have a question? Um, I have one uh, lifestyle question, and I have a, a couple questions about the earlier segments. So um, one question is, are there any um, dietary suggestions or recommendations for particular subtypes of breast cancer in terms of foods to eat or foods to avoid? Yes, so my personal feeling about this, I guess my professional feeling about this, is that there isn't a breast cancer diet per se. Um, in general, I think we are still at the point of saying we think low fat, high fiber. And maybe it's not diet so much as your body composition. So I think there's very good data to say that having a body mass index of 25 or lower is a good thing. Avoiding obesity is a good thing. And no matter how you get there, either through diet or exercise, or most likely through the combination is what it will take, that that's actually what the goal should be. Not so much what you're eating or what kind of exercise you're doing, but what effect it's ultimately having on your BMI and your fitness level. And so I think we try to get away from very specific recommendations about specific diets. The one exception to that is this issue of plant estrogens, which comes up all the time, soy, um, flaxseed, uh, other kinds of plant estrogens, um, do they stimulate uh, estrogen receptor positive breast cancer cells? It's, a, it's, it's again, a murky area. Uh, there is data to support not having soy. There's other data to say that if you've never had breast cancer, actually soy can be protective. I think until we know more, in general, I recommend to patients to not consume large amounts of soy or substitute soy products for other products in their diet but it, it can't get away from it because soy lecithin is a stabilizer in most processed foods, so you're gonna get exposed to it. But it's actually another good reason to try to stay away from the more processed foods and really move toward fresh and whole foods. Okay. Right. So we're getting a lot of questions on our live stream about the difference between metastatic and early stage breast cancer. And specifically, if you have these dormant tumor cells, does that make you metastatic? We have some folks who are really confused about why you wouldn't, why you wouldn't treat if you knew you had the cells. Okay, let me be really clear about this. Early stage breast cancer is breast cancer that is only in the breast and the lymph nodes under the arm. That's early stage breast cancer, and that's a curable type of breast cancer, and that's how we, what we use our standard treatments to eliminate. At the other end of the spectrum is metastatic breast cancer. These are breast cancer cells that are in organs or bones and they're actively growing and, and, and traveling. In the middle 
is a new and different kind of cell that we haven't really been talking about before. Those are the dormant cells. These are cells that aren't active, they're not dividing. So if you give things like chemotherapy that attack rapidly dividing cells, it's not gonna work, mm. number one. Number two, these cells might never hurt you. So we're trying to figure out which cells are harmful and which cells aren't harmful. So this is a very different thing. It is in between early stage disease that definitely needs aggressive treatment and metastatic stage four disease that definitely needs aggressive treatment. This is this gray area in between where we're just starting to understand what the treatments should be. But I think that it's safe to say that the treatments that will work for these cells in the middle are very different than the treatments you would use either for early stage disease or for metastatic disease. Does that help? That's really helpful. Okay. Do you think? I do you think, think so, yes. Okay. Um, another question is how do people get involved in the trial yeah. who are interested in participating? And I think we have a slide that we can bring up with information about that. Yeah, so um, operators are standing by. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> but um, but there, is a, there is a toll free number there on the screen and as well as our website um, where you can uh, go and get more information. I think the important thing that I want to convey today is that this is not, although it seems like you know, an urgent situation, this is not an emergency. Again, these cells are there, they're there for a long time, they're not growing, they're not dividing. So you don't have to do something about this tomorrow or next week. This is something you want to think about. You can contact us. We'll need to go through a you know, pre-screening procedure. It could be that you don't have, even if you decide to have the testing, that you don't have it for a couple of months. It's something that you really want to think about and talk about with your doctor to make sure that you're ready for this, that you're in a good place where you feel like you can handle it, whatever the outcome might be. You could handle the idea of taking more treatment. But it's not an emergency, so take a deep breath. Don't, you know, you can, you can think about it. But we are there when you're ready. I, so I think that's helpful. And I'm just wondering, because we have a very national audience watching um, the web stream. So do you feel like if they go to their doctor, they're going to understand this? Is it better for them to just call you? I mean, I'm trying to figure out what's their best next step. Yeah, I think that um, the website is a good first step because it has all the information about the trial. And I think that if they print that out and bring that to their doctor or ask their doctor to access the website if they don't have access to the internet, that that can start the conversation. And I talk to a lot of physicians around the country who call and ask about the trial. And if patients reach out to us to participate, I always contact their doctors as well. This right. has to be a partnership between our study team and the doctor, the, the, your regular doctor. We actually do have patients who've been coming from all over the country to be part of the trial, but it is a partnership with their doctor at home as well. Okay. I know Janine wants to ask one more question. So last question. Um, some folks are asking, we've talked a lot about the potential benefits of the trial. What are the potential risks of this trial? Anytime you have a procedure or take a medication, there are risks. There are risks to um, a procedure. For example, a bone marrow aspirate, there can be bleeding at the site, there can be bruising, you can get an infection anytime you puncture the skin. These are, these are known risks. I think the bigger risks, though, really are about taking a medication. Um, as much as, as careful as we are to monitor side effects, some patients will have side effects. And although most of these side effects are not long lasting, there are very rare side effects to the drugs that can be permanent or long lasting. For example, there can be some effects on the retina um, that we monitor for. But anytime you take a drug, that's a possibility. So again, I think that this is really taking a step into the future. This is something very new. It's early days. So there's still a lot that we don't know. And we, we talk a lot about those risks. It's really important that women go into it knowing those. Do you want to add anything to that? Well, I was Sue? going to ask if either of you had closing yeah. remarks. So to be about risk. About risk. Um, I didn't see any risk. 
I, didn't, I, I seriously wow. didn't. I didn't think of, of there being any risk. Yes, I could go on a website and I could see what the side effects, side effects of the various medications were that I was taking. Um, and I could monitor that. Um, I didn't think about a risk as far as the bone marrow. Again, you've been through, I've been through cancer surgery. I've been through chemotherapy. I mean, oh, okay. what's, what's the, you know, I don't understand what the question would even be. There is no risk. Okay, Joan, do you want to add anything? Right. Um, well, as a patient advocate, we're always concerned about the side effects of different drugs. And particularly if you combine, you know, two, because then you have maybe two different types of side effects. And actually, some clinical trials propose climb, combining three drugs. So we're very um, on alert about that and knowing what some of the side effects are and just how debilitating they could be. Some side effects are worse than others, and some side effects can really compromise your quality of life more than others. So as a patient advocate, um, and other advocates, we try to kind of figure out what's, what's happening and the side effects. Great. Well, I want to thank all three of you um, for spending time with us this evening. This is really important information. You did a great job explaining it, Dr. D. Michelle. It's wonderful to have someone who's actually been through it and someone who's advocating for you know, better trials. It's, it's, it's really been great. I want to thank everyone for participating. We will be emailing a link to our evaluation. We really hope you'll fill it out. That's how we learn how to do our programs better. We also will have a link if you want to sign up for our webinar about dealing with the fear of recurrence. And um, there is information on the trial on our website. So if you have more questions, you can find it there as well. Thank you. Thank you. you did a great job.